<laughs> but apart from the flying triangles, I think there were a lot of flying knives flying as well. Knives, yeah. 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 yeah, there yeah. was. Um, it was a bit dangerous, but the knives were introduced actually by a roadie of ours, um, Lemmy, who later went on to lead a, uh, a heavy metal band called uh, Motorhead. And it was actually Lemmy that reminded me of this. Um, uh, you probably, you guys probably don't remember Lemmy. I, I do, remember yeah, Lemmy, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he was a roadie for us. He used to have yeah. me. me and I started using like a, like a, I think a Turkish, uh, you know, dagger to, to hold the, the keys down. Yeah. And um, it was Lemmy that came up to me and he said, that, yeah, you know what, um, <laughs> if you're going to use a knife, use a proper one. Yeah. And he handed me a Hitler Youth dagger. God. Which is what he was into, all of those. Oh, yes, um, and they, the, they're not very good throwing knives. No. And, uh, which Brian was to find out. And uh, I, I used to stick them in the, in the keyboard and, you know... They formed a cord. They mm, jammed yeah. two yes. down, jammed another one. Yes. This cord would carry on being while Keith improvised with uh-huh. two hands free, like a third hand. So there was a musical need or purpose yeah. to oh, this yeah. knife throwing. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. Yes. Good heavens. But having provided a musical purpose, one had to get rid of these stuck in there. <laughs> and what better way, if they're knives, it, then you throw them. You know, and I wasn't a very good knife thrower. Oh. Still aren't. Really? And okay. I used to lob them into the Leslie, didn't I you? used to lob them. Yeah, some used to stick in, some used to glance off at an angle. And we came off after one particularly wonderful gig, and I was very pleased. And I got into the dressing room, and there's Brian sporting a huge cut <laughs> across here somewhere. And he said, who the fuck do you think you are? <laughs> I uh, told you not to do that. No, he I said, who the please fuck... Please don't throw knives in this gig because it wasn't on for it. Yeah, yeah and he said, who the fuck do you think you are? Errol Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing them. I think it might help if you sharpened them from time to time. Mm. And then they would sort of stick in the wood of the Leslie cabinet. Mm. But apart from the knives and the whips and uh, probably a few explosions as well, I think <clears throat> Keith also developed this amazing technique of actually riding the uh, L100 across the stage. Oh, that was that was yeah, yeah that that was quite remarkable because I uh, I used to climb on top it you know, on top yeah. with with the whip and and just you know rock it backwards and forwards. But to my utter amazement, I actually found that that it would actually walk across the stage, and I could actually chase. <laughs> Lee. Lee. <laughs> along on this rock and hammond, I thought it was just, I thought it was actually great. I thought. Yeah. Wow, number one, you know, the, first of all, you know, the keyboard player, which is meant to be static, mm. can actually move around the stage <laughs> like a guitar player. This was great for me. All 350 pound of it. Yeah. All three, yeah. So I'd sort of, you know, ride it across the stage almost like a, a jockey. <laughs> and um, no, it was, it was a great highlight of the show until I think we played with Amen Corner and we were at Green's Theatre in Scotland <coughs> and somebody had the sense of humour to nail... Uh, my the L100 baseboard. nail the baseboard down to the stage so I jump on it and I'm intending to chase Lee and I, well, I'm stuck <laughs> that was hilarious. I ain't going anywhere you know. the best one we played at Ilpai Island and we're doing this Keith's on top and he's going all the bit and he comes to the end and he's got it on his chest and he's playing it from behind mm-hmm. which is amazing I mean mm-hmm. how how he can play it upside down beats me but play it upside down as if he was playing it the right way and it got to the end and he vaulted back and what he hadn't realised, he'd got it to the edge of the stage and the stage was ten foot up in the air. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he goes, Neow! and the, the Hammond died away with a flick-off switch. And normally he would press it back on, go, oh, and I would come and he'd start playing the number again. It died away and nothing, me and him standing there going, diddle 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 You and Brian? Yeah. Mm. Where is he? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he bolted off into the audience because we couldn't see him. When? Well, I disappeared into the dark depths of the pit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, it was one I didn't break any you know, bones or whatever, so I had to find my way back on stage. So I went to the side wings where there was the usual... All the while. Yeah, all the while this dum 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 is going on stage. And I try and find my way back onto the stage and there's this... Um, well, as we used to call them in those days, jobs worth. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's more than my jobs worth. Security you can't eat you back in. Mm-hmm. You don't have a pass to come backstage. I said, well, I've just come... <laughs> falling off the stage. I've just come from up there. And um, they said, I'm sorry, if you don't... <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, we're not. I said, if you don't let me out on stage, these guys are going to go dum 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 forever. You know, I'm going to have to go up there and finish it off. This is Spinal Tap. Yeah, really. So, well, eventually Baz came to the rescue, and I don't know, he pushed the guy aside and dragged all nine stone of me and threw me back out on the stage and. Of course, Lee and Brian were very relieved yeah. <laughs> that I'd made my reappearance and we were able to finish the show. You know? yeah, yeah. But the organ itself didn't fall off the stage ever. Oh, stages. it has done. Ah. Yeah, it has done, many times. Yeah, thank God for, uh, you know, no injury to, uh, to the audience. Mm. But there was one number where there was a tremendous crash on the Hammond, wasn't there? We used to drop it. And uh, what, what piece was that, Keith? Oh, was God. There were, but there were a lot of accidents. You know, as I said before, there were so many accidents that, that we derived and uh, we'd make use of, really. You know, it's like... Um, mm-hmm. And I learned how to control the, uh, mm-hmm. the, 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 the crash yeah. of the explosion. I'd, I'd yeah. use your drumstick sometimes yeah. to achieve... Yeah. Um, you know, I'd hit the reverberation chamber. Yeah. Inside the uh, inside the Hammond, That's right, yeah. and it it would look like I was beating the yeah. living daylights mm. out of uh, so your yeah. bed is the reverb chamber yeah. at the bottom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It looks for all the world like the bars on an old-fashioned electric fire. Three springs, three or four springs, mm-hmm. stretched in a little thing. Uh, Hit that. that would crash and go off like, and he got in the back with a drumstick after that. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> But it was all the influence of John Cage, you know, when you stick ping pong balls inside of a piano, you yes. just sit there for five minutes and look at it, and that's mm. a piece of music. Yeah, yeah. I once bought a piece of John Cage music, and that's all it is. It's just a blank piece of paper. Because mm. you didn't have yeah. a, a synthesizer in those days, or did you, Keith? Were, were you able to use a, a synthesizer with, with an ice, or had it not been invented? We did. It came in towards the end. Yeah, yeah, we did yeah. We did use it. Um, I, I, I became aware of it when um, Switched On Bark uh, was, was a hit. When Wendy was still Walder. Mm. Yeah, when Wendy was still Walter Wendy Carlos. Walter Carlos. And uh, I walked into a Soho shop, and um, I knew the the uh, proprietor of that shop, and he knew that the Nice had recorded Brandenburg, which was the uh, Brandenburg Concerto in G by Bach. And he said, well, I've got another version for you to hear. And I heard it, and it was Walter Carlos's uh, Switched On Bach. And I I listened to it, I thought, wow, that's... It's a bit bottom-heavy. It was a bit, you know, but that's incredible. And he, he showed me a picture of how this music was produced. And it was, um, to me, it looked like a telephone switchboard with all mm-hmm. leads and everything st- stuck into it. And I went out of my way to find out mm-hmm. if England actually had one of these. And um, it was actually Tony Stratton Smith that wrote to America. And I've still got the letter. He wrote it to, he, he wrote it to Walter Sear, who was then with the Mo Company. Uh, and we were asking for, I was asking to get a free one mm-hmm. because I thought that um, I probably deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> and back came the letter from Walter Sear about two weeks later. said, thank you very much for your um, uh, interest in the Moog synthesizer. First of all, we don't really recommend it uh, for, for bands. It's not reliable for touring with. Mm. And secondly, uh, we, we, our policy is not to uh, give these instruments away. And seeing as the Rolling Stones and the Beatles have already bought theirs, I see no reason why you should not buy yours. So, anyway, it was worth a try. Mm. Did you ever get one? I mean, did you get a freebie? Or? Well, I borrowed one that Mike Vickers from Manfred Mann had at the time. Mm. And uh, we did a concert at the uh, Fairfield Hall with uh, with an orchestra yeah. where we played uh, 2001 oh, and we also okay. did the um, Five Bridges Suite and it was then that I realised the possibilities yeah. that, that, uh, and the expansion that a keyboard could actually do yeah. you know it was um, it was a tricky instrument to operate on stage yeah. and of course when I f- went into uh, went on to uh, ELP uh, that uh, that became one of, you know, another instrument that defined their sound. 
So the nice had this. Okay. The nice started out playing in small pubs and clubs, and then by the end of the sixties, you were playing really major concerts, two-hour shows at big venues, as we mentioned, like the Royal Albert Hall and the Festival Hall, and touring America as well. So, what was a, a typical set like? What was a concert like by the nice? How would you prepare the show, and, and what sort of numbers did you actually play during that uh, mammoth two-hour performance? Mm. Ooh, gosh, set list. I remember we always started, when we did the big, all the tours, you know, we did our own headline and tour, mm -hmm. we always started with Karelia because of the quiet start. Oh, yeah. I remember oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a good one. What we followed with, I don't know. Um, you know, in the second set, I don't remember what we started with, but we been something fairly heavy, but then we did a, not a medley, but we did all our Dylan repertoire, which by that time was She Belongs to Me, which was probably the end. Used to do Flower King of Flies. That was a, one of oh, the early that, that was long gone. That was that one of the gone, ones that yeah. didn't survive Davy. Mm. He was the principal singer on that. Mm. Um, yes, we did. Yeah. Was yeah. current then. Yeah, we did the Pathetic. Um, Country Pie. Country Pie was was. I love playing that. Yeah, that yeah, was brilliant. Yeah. Mm. Um, did you try and structure a concert so that you could bring the audience up and? and down, have a big yeah. sort of high at the end. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the way it would have worked. I it? think it was a matter of trial and error. You know, we'd sort of like come off stage and discuss what went down and what didn't go down mm -hmm. and what we all felt comfortable playing and what we didn't feel comfortable playing. And uh, we'd uh, really get the repertoire mm -hmm. hinged around that. Obviously, you've got to start off good. Uh, as Lee said, you know, the d dramatic approach was with the Corelia suite, mm. uh, Sibelius, with this long drone at mm. the beginning, and then dun 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 dun, dun, dun. and Lee would echo that dun, on his dun, uh, dun, 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 dun. Ah, with yes. the board bass. See, by this time you have the audience's attention, mm. and it's not like really coming on stage with a complete crash of sound. It, you yeah. start it with a complete dimmed lights. Mm. And then suddenly, you know, the, the the rhythm starts coming in with Lee playing the bass and and Brian, you know, chum, t -t -t -t, which is just a, it just gave it a th bit of a throb, didn't it, mate? Bit of a pulse. <laughs> bit of a pulse. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, could you play a but set like that today? I mean, would audiences accept such a variety of music, different styles, different tempos? And I don't think it, I don't think we ever played in different styles when we played. I think it was all. It, it was, you know, it us. was, what would you call it? The sound mm. that we created was through every piece that we played, really, It was, really, sub, wasn't it was it? subconscious uh, mm. after the like initials. Like just fed ideas off of each other. It, yeah. it, you know, I mean, I, uh, as much as I, you see, I, not being a drummer, I was able to sort of like say to Brian, well, it's got to have this sort of pose to it, yeah. and he'd come up with it. That the hardest thing I think was 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 writing music uh, and hoping that that Lee could actually sing it. Mm -hmm. um, in effect, I think what I was looking for was an extension of my piano playing, mm. which uh, I've since learned is an impossible thing to ask from mm. anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to find the right keys, the right. Uh, uh, yes, but you know, I, uh, Lee can probably continue with this. But I was a very stubborn. Uh, person and if I happen to write something at the keyboard and I think every keyboard player will know that when you write something in a particular key mm. you write it in that particular key for a reason mm. because that's the only key it should be in mm. and it doesn't matter if somebody's got to sing it they've got to sing it in that sure. key <laughs> So were and so he had a lot of trouble. Mm. Were there tensions within the band sometimes? I mean, I know what it's like a band being on the road and having to uh, put on a show every other night. I mean, was it exhausting physically and mentally for you? It, it's exhausting for, for, I think, for everybody. I mean, mm. particularly when, you know, I, I was very, very demanding, I, I think, in those days. And, uh, you know, I wanted Lee to write a lyric in five minutes for something which uh, I thought was so simple you know mm. I can sing this why can't you sing it mm. um, but in fact I couldn't mm. sing I mean, I was... there was one funny bit he had heard Lalo's Sinfonia Espanol mm -hmm. 
See, you're singing it now. Yeah. 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 Why couldn't you do it then? Yeah. Because you had a different <laughs> bloody key. <laughs> so he says, why don't you write some words to this? I thought, oh, okay, you know. Weeks went by and nothing was coming up. And finally we're going on a gig somewhere and I had a brainwave. And the lyric I wrote was, I can't think of words to this music, nor reason nor rhyme to abuse it. And on it went from there. I got that line and I was away. I was sat in the band and I wrote the damn thing in five minutes. And I was so then happy. Then I had to try and sing it because we'd recorded the track. Mm -hmm. I was so happy that there were some lyrics. You know? yes. It didn't matter what dreck it was. It was <laughs> lyrics, you know? it was brilliant. That was a brilliant flash. I it think, was. You know? I couldn't sing it. Mm. And I'd, we'd already recorded the, the, the track. The, the basic three instruments, you know, and it was great. And it was a bit went down, down, da 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 And I had to say, down, down, da 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 Yeah. But the way the way it had to be sung, I was having to sing up the scale while playing down the scale simultaneously, and I couldn't do it. What was the song called, Lee? What was this? It was called Diary of an MTD, based on Lelo's Symphony Espanol. Mm. Yeah. It's a brilliant piece of music. That's Which we cool. heard, the first time we ever heard it, we played in Paris. Why we were there, I have no idea. But it was the Paris French television, probably still do, and, and they have the, a, a sneak preview of the f Paris Spring collections, and all, and all the top designers were there. And one designer actually got out a violin and played this, it was Paco Rabanne. Mm. But there was Dion, Courage, and all these gorgeous models. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a wonderful day, that was. <laughs> so you were throwing each other musical challenges all the time yeah. in the nice. And Brian, did you find that uh, I mean, challenging and exciting? I mean, were there problems for you as well in uh, no, I think providing the no, percussion? I, no, not really. I think the only time I felt any uh, pressure was, uh, I think, one, one of the gigs at the Fillmore East when uh, I thought, We'd reached the pinnacle before uh, the big stop, and you decided to go on. Yeah. yeah, you decided to go on for a few more minutes. I thought my arms were going to drop off because I was doing this sort of single stroke roll effect between, well, no, single stroke uh, between the bass drum and and the floor tom tom. Yes, and riding along like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's awesome. Then, though, oh it? yeah, I said, please come to an end, please, you know. <laughs> <laughs> up and up and up and up yeah, and something up, I, would get the it nod. It was all right, yes. but it wasn't, you know, I, I could feel that I was coming to the, going over the edge. Yes. Not yes. just coming to the edge, which I, I think the band we used to do quite a lot, go to the edge, yeah. you know, which was quite, that's what one of the Especially things that made that it very exciting. It yeah. went crashing up to a huge crescendo and had a signal from Keith. Mm. It usually involved him leaping into the air and coming down hand mm. on the keyboard. It stopped. Dead on the blot, just like that. Mm. One single note carried on at about a thousandth of the decibels that had previously been. It was one of the greatest pieces of dynamics mm. I've ever seen, and I'm proud to have been in the band that did it. Yeah. And, it would wow. rump, and 99 times out of 100, Ooh. it worked absolutely wonderful. But that, that, he was going, and I was just dropping off here. <laughs> so what would, what would you say were the most exciting gigs that you remember towards the, the peak of the band's career? I mean... America must have been very exciting for you when you the played Fillmore, East. The Fillmore yeah. East that we recorded. One of, one of my favourites. Yeah. And that was the live album, wasn't that it? That was the live yeah. album, yeah. yeah. And it was, it was even more exciting there. I mean, that is the only thing that, to me that we ever recorded that captured the band as I saw it. Yeah. And, and, and as it was, you can hear it all. There's the only time, none of the studio things ever come anywhere close because yeah. we tried to produce it ourselves and I think looking back that we should have had an independent producer yeah. but there was no to produce with that was, we just got out and we played it and we all communicated yeah. Yeah. mentally and by eye signal contact and, and, and just general metaphysical yeah. communication yeah. and it worked Fantastic. Yes. yes. And it was a naturally high energy. And we didn't play, band, yeah, anyway, we didn't play Diary of an Empty Day. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, the audiences were, uh, I mean, very responsive at this point, weren't they? I mean, the band really were very successful, yeah. would you say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you were probably what, the, the hit band in the country, I think, by 1969. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I think we were, well, we were invited to go to um, L.A., in 1970 
to mainly to play America. Yeah. But uh, much to my disgust, America was arranged by somebody else. I believe that the composer, Leonard Bernstein, wasn't too happy, was he, about your treatment of the piece? Well, apparently, I don't know um, whether he was or not. The, the, we made some concessions towards Bernstein's uh, America by way that uh, we called it America's Second Amendment because we used Dvorak's New World Symphony and that was out of copyright, mm. whereby Bernstein's America was still seriously in copyright. Mm. So we eventually came to uh, an arrangement with Bernstein's um, publishing company. Mm. But and you became friends later as well, I believe. Is that right? Or, or maybe not. <laughs> 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 well, you, let me say you knew him. <laughs> He liked my Bernstein, leathers, apparently. If, if yeah. Bernstein had his way, it would have been in the biblical way. Steady. Yes, he did like my leathers. Ah, right. Mm. So if, if the nice do get back together and you do play gigs together, what, what do you think? Uh, will the sense of humour still be there, do you think? Um, oh, I think so. Yeah. 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 Well, we've grown up a bit more. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't. Uh, yeah, a bit. <laughs> I'll probably a bit still more. fall off the organ into the, you know, into the audience. But uh, no, it's um, you know, we're we're looking at it and uh, you know, re-establishing it properly. You know, uh, I we're looking for a guitar player now. Anybody out there? Ah, right. uh, got to be able to sing though, because I don't mm. have to sing it all. Mm. Mm. So it could be an exciting. I mean, other musicians as well. It won't just be the three of you and. The new nice, if this does happen. Well, I think the concept can go on, you know. Mm. I mean, the, 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 the nice needn't just mean Lee, Brian and me. It can you know, mean other, you know. Other musicians too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And don't tell me about an orchestra at this point. No. <laughs> <laughs> don't mention orchestra. I won't mention orchestras, yeah. So the story continues. This is going to be nice part two, we think. Yeah, hopefully. Well, I would hope so, yes. Good, yeah. Hey guys, great yeah. to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's it. That's yeah. it, folks. Thank you very much. Okay.